I, I got to know Dave when I was writing the Facebook effect because he was at Facebook at the time as a very senior guy. Um, I'll just give you his quick Facebook bio. He had actually been at Apple trying to get Apple social and failed, <laughs> not for any fault of his own, but because Steve Jobs never had a clue about social. But, um, and he came to Facebook in late 2006 uh, and then got very involved in the, uh, app, the uh, launch of the platform, which was the early, in May of 2007, and then became sort of the head marketing person for the platform, traveling all around the world, trying to convince people that, yeah, you should probably build apps that worked on Facebook, which was at the time a novel idea. We won't, unfortunately, have much time to talk about that here, but then when did you leave Facebook? What? Uh, at the end of 2009, early 2010. And when did you start PATH? Uh, right at the same time. Didn't take any time off. <laughs> okay, well, let's go right into it. Why did you start PATH? Probably to my own chicken. So you were, you were at Facebook, you were a real believer, but you've set up something that, in some people's view, is an alternative, even a, in a competitor in some respects. Why did you go to PATH? And let, but maybe let me quickly define PATH just more journalistically than you might want to do it. But, you know, the interesting thing about PATH is it was one of the first apps that was designed completely, one of the first websites, shall we say, that was not a website. It was purely mobile business. It, it never really existed on the web. It's been a mobile product from day one. It's a circumscribed social experience for a limited number of users. Started with, the maximum was 50, now the maximum is 150. Why did you do that? So. One big reason was mobile. Uh, at the end of 2009, I was looking at uh, Mary Meeker's internet report, and at the very end of the year, she released her, her report, and there was one slide that was different than all of the others, and it said that uh, by 2013, the mobile internet would be larger and faster growing. Uh, than the desktop internet. And so I kind of looked at that chart and saw 10 years worth of skills building web software becoming worthless in three years and thought that uh, it was pretty important to focus on, you know, uh, understanding multi-touch interface, mobile, and all these kinds of things. The other, uh, I guess, more personal insight was that I spent a whole lot of time working at Facebook and towards the end of my time there, I started to realize that I never interacted with my girlfriend on Facebook. Uh, and I never interacted with my mother, with my sister, with the people that I care about the most. I spent a lot of time interacting with people that I'm loosely connected to, but to the people who I care about the most, there was no space for that. And so um, I was really interested in, in trying to create a, a, a place that was more trusted, that felt sort of like your family home rather than perhaps a party or a city. And so um, that's kind of the, the impetus for PATH. And one of the things about PATH is that it's, it's got privacy built in by default in that really if you're not really as part of someone's circle which is less than 150, you don't see their stuff, right? Yeah, we're pretty... We're pretty uh, strongly opinionated about how the network is structured. It's very simple. You can only have one list of friends. You can have up to 150 friends. Only the people who you've uh, connected to can see your content. There's not a lot of sharing and resharing of things. So the people who you're connected to are the people who see it. You have full control. Um, and we don't, we don't try to make it complicated. We just try to keep it really simple. I got to say, though, I do see people's comments on my friends' comments sometimes who are not my friends. Yeah, Why so is that? each person has a different set of friends, and so, uh, you know, any, po any post that you see can have a, a slightly different audience, and so... So you can have some exposure to people you don't know through that means, so you have to be aware of that at least. Indeed, but the cool thing is, because people have made such explicit uh, and very careful choices about who they're connected to, generally those people that you're interacting with might be somebody that you might want to get to know because your friend trusts them. Okay, so how is PATH doing? Uh, pretty well. We just launched a uh, new search feature in December um, uh, focused on, you know, the, the big idea besides, you know, having a more limited uh, and really being fo focused on your close friends and family, the big idea behind PATH is that it's your path through life. It's sort of a journal of all of your important moments, important memories. And so we just launched a really fantastic natural language search interface that allows you to go back in time and tell a story. Um, we really wanted to solve that problem where we all pull out our iPhone and try to scroll through your 
camera library to tell somebody a story, and we wanted to make that process instant. Um, so we launched that. Uh, the good news is our traffic's up 50% just over the last month, thanks to that feature. Um, we, uh, we announced 5 million users in December, uh, and we're actually nearing 6 million now. Um, so we're growing pretty quickly, and uh, traffic's up. So um, those are all good things. And how are you doing in Germany and Europe? So in Germany, we're still pretty small. Um, in Europe in general, we've got a good presence in the UK, in France, in Italy. Um, Germany's just starting to ramp up. Um, and uh, our bigger, bigger markets are the US and Asia right now. But given Germany is so obsessed with privacy, way over obsessed in my opinion, I would think that PATH would be appealing here. Don't you think that? Uh, indeed. I mean, we really prioritize both both privacy and design, we care a lot about quality. So, um, I would, you know, I think that uh, it's a perfect product for the German market. Uh, it's one of the reasons why why I came. How many Germans in the room are you members of Path? Well, that's quite a few. How many Germans in the room are not members of Path? <laughs> more than more. <laughs> about okay. The well, same. you should use it because you people are obsessed with privacy. Um, anyway. Um, Okay, well, you just mentioned search, and you know, I want to point out, you did that before Facebook did it. Uh, but the other thing that Facebook has done in the not recent past is go to the timeline, which is extremely related to path, and you know, path is intended to be the history of your life for your close friends, but timeline clearly is explicitly intended by Facebook to be a personal history that they ultimately believe will go from birth to, you know, perish the thought death. Um, <laughs> So how do you, do you see that as a challenge for you? Is it a problem for you? Not necessarily, um, because if you were to compare the two, one of the interesting things about PATH is that people post multiple times a day, and it's entirely mobile. Um, our goal was always to not necessarily ask you to dump all of the photos that you've ever taken into your PATH or to, you know, put in this giant archive of your entire life into your path. We actually spend most of our time thinking about individual days. How do we help people understand and answer that question? At, you know, at the end of the day, when you come home to your family, you all ask each other the question, how was your day? And that's what we're the most interested in, is how was your day? How do we uh, help people feel like they're more a part of each other's day than on any other, you know, any other network, any other system, and create that sort of intimate sense of really understanding that you know you had a good day, you had a bad day, you know you had a few experiences today. Um, how do you how do you help people feel like they're they're more in each other's lives? And so we spend a, a lot of time uh, thinking about that. And so though metaphorically the two are similar, um, I think over the long term we end up with both because of the way that we're focused on that and because we're focused on a much more limited audience, we get a much more nuanced, much more personal, frankly, a lot more private uh, moments in PATH that provide a kind of color that you just don't see anywhere. Was that an answer to my question? I'm not sure it was. But, I mean, so timeline doesn't compete with you then? Um, to some extent it does, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, what about... Um, could Facebook build something like Path inside itself? I mean, it has tried sort of off and on, and then sort of everything kind of leaks out, at least that's the perception. Uh, what do you think about Facebook as a competitor for Path, or do you think about that? We think about it. Um, I think on some, probably on some different uh, products we're competitors. They have groups, they have different lists. Um, they've got a variety of different mobile products. Um, they, they're doing a lot of different things. And, um, and so, yeah, we do overlap in some ways. Um, in other ways, we don't. You know, we spend a lot of time very specifically focused on the set of you know, 150 people and less. We try to build use cases and types of content that you don't see on Facebook. So, for example, one of the most popular types of content on PATH is uh, when you uh, is sleep. So people share when they go to bed and when they wake up. Um, you don't see that kind of content anywhere else. Um, and so I think... So linking my Fitbit to PATH makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, between the types of content and the, 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 the simplicity of the system, you know, um, I think that those are the vectors that we're trying to, you know, compete on, not necessarily trying to be a broad, very horizontal system that that sort of solves every use case. Do you think Facebook would ever want to buy you? I, I don't know. Would you be interested in that? Uh, no, I mean, long term, we're, 
we're interested in trying to create a, a sustainable long-term business. Um, you know, we've had uh, people, you know, uh, talk about that with us in the past, and it's just not something that we're interested in. We're, we're much more interested in trying to create a business that's around for the long term. I mean, uh, just like the title of this talk says, we, we take the fact that we have, uh, you know, uh, a lot of your memories very seriously, and we want to be a place that lives on for a long period of time, and we focus on really delivering value to every one of our customers over the long term. And so, you know, I think that's pretty important to us. To what extent is Path a platform? I mean, could I link my Fitbit to it, for example, right uh, now? Your Fitbit, no, but we do have a platform integration with Nike. So you can, uh, and, uh, ironically, uh, DLD, I think, gave a Nike fuel band to everyone at DLD. You can link the Nike fuel band to your path, um, and so you can share your daily activity uh, uh, with, with your path. Uh, we also are integrated with Nike Running. So um, if you go on a run, uh, it's a really nice experience, actually. When you go out for a run, we actually send a push notification to all of your friends. Because you have not as many friends on PATH, we're able to do that. We send a push notification, we say David's out for a run in Munich, um, and your friends can leave a comment or put, in a, put a smile on your run, and you actually hear cheers in your headphones when you're out on the run, uh, which is kind of fun. When they put the ch a smile in or Yeah, yeah so you actually the, hear cheers. But is, it a, is it a one-off integration or is it a platform that people can just write to? Uh, it's a one-off integration now, but um, our intention is that uh, we'll continue to roll that out and make it available to more and more people. So certainly Jawbone and Fitbit would be able to, in your hopes, in Absolutely. the near future. I mean, you would want them, I would assume. Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, you know, one of the things we were talking about that I found very interesting uh, in prep prepping for this was that you are not blocked in China. How is China a significant market for you? And, and what is your understanding of why is they don't block you? Uh, it, is a t it is one of our top markets. Uh, it's in our top five. And um, so we're lucky. I think mostly due to Apple's efforts in China. You know, the App Store is available there. The iPhone's available there. Um, we also have a pretty large Android presence there. Um, as far as an understanding as to why, um, we're not sure. We have no honest understanding of why. Um, you know, because of the limitation on the number of friends, um, you know, that's certainly something that makes the system behave in a slightly different way. Uh, we're, one of our strongest segments is also family, and so uh, family is a big part of Chinese society. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I think because of some of these reasons, perhaps, but, um, you know, you never know. I know you've said that it's a test of when someone's really getting into PATH that they start connecting with their family members there. And that, how, do you have any data on how often that happens for your users? Yeah, we think, uh, at least from the data that we've looked at, about, you know, 50% of our user base or so um, is connected to some type of family member. Um, one thing I can tell you is that if you join PATH and uh, you only have a couple of friends, uh, the experience is actually not, not designed to withstand that use case very well. You know, once you've connected to about five to 10 people, um, the experience becomes very rich and very engaging. And especially if you connect to your family, uh, it, it, it becomes a way that um, everybody can stay connected. A lot of families are geographically diverse. Um, people, you know, I think, desire to be in each other's lives. Um, the, quite frankly, the, the, the emails that I get from customers that keep us going every day uh, are the emails where we hear from people that uh, PATH has brought their family closer together and um, that no other technology has ever done that. And I think that um, at the end of the day, that's what our mission is. We want to bring people closer together. And um, in particular, we like focusing on family. And you know, it seems to be working. A related thing that's happening is the, you know, some companies are adopting PATH instead of Yammer or Chatter or, or some, you know, some of those other uh, social uh, enterprise tools. How do you feel about that? Is that something you want to encourage? I would think that it would kind of preclude you from using it for the other purposes if you were doing that in your company. Yeah, it's an interesting use case. Um, we've been very focused on family for the last year, and uh, we had some really strong growth in the last few months uh, in the southern part of the United States and up the eastern seaboard. And so we actually went out and interviewed a bunch of people and asked, you know, tried to figure out what are the different 
types of users that are using the system, and one of them that you know one of them that was very strong was family, uh, the, and one of the other ones was this business use case, which is uh, I guess surprising to us. We didn't you know I guess we didn't design it for that. When you design technology, you never know how people are going to use it. But um, we've we've heard that use case where people are using it for internal communications. We've also heard uh, people with small client lists, so uh, art dealers, real estate agents. Um, for some reason, it's a it's an interesting use case. Would you would you encourage or allow people to use it, have multiple path networks? Um, it's not something that we've done so far. Uh, it's one of those things where we have to strike a balance between simplicity uh, and providing controls that make sense. We really, you know, we like the fact that when you open path, you don't have to think about multiple lists or circles or, you know, different groups of people that you have inside of the system. We like that when you click that app icon and the app comes forward, uh, you know who's in there and it feels like a, you know, a space that you understand. And so it's something we might consider, but we would really want to put a lot of thought into it so that people didn't have to think too much when they post. Okay, a key question I can't let you off stage without asking you is revenue and, and money. Uh, your backers are... Andreessen Horowitz, Excel, uh, Kleiner Perkins and Index. Kleiner Perkins yeah. and that's not a bad group. Uh, that suggests people have hope, a lot of hope that you're going to do some very cool things. But what do you tell them about what's going to happen financially? So since day one, we've been very focused on. Uh, chasing an alternative revenue model uh, than you see most social systems, uh, uh, at least in the United States. Um, so we focus entirely on premium services and premium virtual goods, which actually you see a lot of the uh, Asian chat networks, Asian social networks tend to monetize that way, and a lot of the social games in the United States. This is what been. you intend to do, because you've barely yeah. done anything with revenue thus far, right? Yeah, we barely started. So we provide, right now, uh, premium filters for photos that you can buy. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are premium. We're going to be rolling out new categories of virtual goods uh, in the first half of this year. And we're also very specifically focused on a premium uh, subscription service. And so we're going to be rolling that out uh, at the start of the year as well. To subscribe to what? Uh, we're still working through it. Uh, we've done a bunch of research over the last six months. But the features that we'll provide will be things that to a normal new user, probably wouldn't be that interesting. But to users who are, uh, you know, intense users of the system and they want more personalization options, they want different things that, uh, you know, a, a more basic user wouldn't want. Uh, we'll provide those in our premium service. So, so what are your big ambitions long term for this thing? I mean, have is there any that you haven't mentioned? I mean, obviously, so you're growing. When did you announce search? In December, was it? December. And you've grown 50% in usage since then, in a month and a half. Yes. That's not bad. Yeah. Uh, keep that growth rate going, you could get, you know, a little bit bigger, right? Indeed. Um, I think our grand ambition, you know, if you look at the biggest internet businesses in the world, you know, they end up with a billion customers and, um, you know, th there's certain, certainly a lot of people in the world that have families and so uh, we think the path could be relevant to anyone with a family. So, uh, you know, in, in, some, in some cases that could be everybody in the world, but I think that since we're so focused on quality um, that we're a little bit less worried about getting to a billion as fast as we can, and we want to, you know, follow a curve that's uh, perhaps a little bit more uh, slow growing, a little bit more intentional. Um, in, in a world where, you know, Facebook is a is the city or Facebook is a is a Chevy, you know, uh, we're trying to be more like an Audi or BMW, uh, and really focus on quality and really focus on engagement and providing really deep value to to the user. If you can do that, it's good. That's what Steve Jobs said he was trying to do. He didn't do a bad job of it. Um, I want to end on the back on this privacy stuff because we're really running out of time. Um, I, since I was supposed to be up here tomorrow also with Dan Rose of Facebook, but he's not going to be here, I have to make one statement because as a longtime DLD guy, I love Germany, I love coming here. But I think that Germany and its regulatory environment has not been getting sufficient criticism on the stages of DLD. What Fa Germany is trying to do with Facebook by requiring anonymity is stupidly ignorant and is not true privacy protection. It's in effect a way of trying to tell Facebook not to operate in Germany because Facebook could never operate an anonymously. So please tell your regulators to get a life. Um, 
And, but with that statement, uh, which I just had to have a chance to say in public here, um, you know, here we because go. privacy was always embedded in, let's just end with, 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 you know, you said some really interesting things as we were prepping, um, that we'd sort of been creating all this data, but, and you have a vision for where it's going down the road, and, and you do offer a privacy model. Maybe the German regulators should require people to use PATH instead of Facebook if they're so worried about it. I mean, what do you, what do you think's happening not, not with privacy? Idea. Yeah, long term, uh, what's happening? Um, well, I think that what's interesting is that over the last 10 years, we've spent a lot of time um, building systems that store a lot of data, right? And, um, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of interesting conversations going on as Facebook's rolling out their search product and people are saying things like, well, I didn't know that I connected to that person or I liked this weird thing from five years ago. In the S&M side? Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and it's interesting that uh, one of the most popular applications in the App Store today is uh, this application called Snapchat, which actually creates the absence of data, right? It does, you don't store any data in the system. Um, and, uh, you know, we're really focused on uh, connecting you only to a limited number of people. When you run out of people, you have to remove someone. Um, and so I think that the human condition is one where, you know, People have this amazing capacity to forget things. You know, we have conversations, they, 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 they stay around for the length of the conversation, and then they go away, right? And I think more and more technology has to map to the human experience. And we've, we've, we've done things a lot in technology just for the sake of doing them. You know, we say, oh, well, storage is free, so we should store everything, right? Uh, or encryption is possible, so we should just do it, you know? And instead of sort of taking a look at what is the human experience? How does it work? How does a conversation really work? You know, I'm looking at you, I'm not looking at you. I'm, you know, there's all these different cues that we have in real, you know, in real human interaction. There's a lot of the stuff that we say every day is not stored away somewhere where it can be queried and found all the time. Um, and so I think that the future looks a lot like um, being a lot more human and inter interactions that are a lot more human. And I think that we're seeing that sort of begin to play out in some of these application experiences. And, um, you know, I, I think regulators are certainly interested in, um, I think it's good that, uh, you know, that regulators are starting to get more interested in the topic. Um, it seems clear that the word privacy actually needs a lot more definitions. You know, sometimes when people say privacy, they mean security. Sometimes when they say privacy, they mean, you know, one thing or the other. And I think there's a lot more nuance to it than, uh, uh, then we perhaps give it credit. But so. perhaps an absence of data is the future rather than the abundance about us that we've had. Yeah. It's a very insightful way to end, so thank you so much, Dave. Thank Sadly, you. We have to end.